Ladies and gentlemen, I guess that's it. Um, last, last performance for today. So um, it is our pleasure to share with you a case study and a method to quantify the innovation value of patents and patent portfolios. So we're hoping this presentation will be, will be inspiring for anybody who wants to accelerate and streamline a patenting process or a product or process um, development. One of the authors, unfortunately, cannot be with us today. That's Jean Ann Glasgow from Spore. And so she's the only lawyer in our team. So I try to present her slide. I try to do my best to present her slides too. But bear with me on those. So um, if you have any questions or comments, you're welcome to ask them afterwards or also to contact us at a later time. Now, first of all, I just wanted to review the patent process, which you all probably know much better than myself. Um, the traditional process starts pretty much with a, a review of the previous patents, then a draft, and then you start filing and so on. Now, basic, so basically the process starts at what is noted here as at the stage V1. So, However, a good technical and legal pre-analysis could help avoiding pitfalls that occur later on in the process. Um, so that's why it is very important to evaluate the individual claims. To, um, it, it would help to evaluate the individual claims to make sure that those claims that are the most important are covered and protected. So a pre-analysis could ensure that um, the claims are not being formulated too broad or too specific um, to, in order to secure the protection of subject matter. Developing, developing a strategy for the patenting process, uh, for the patent really will, he help you, uh, will help to save money in the long run. And um, this is only possible with a thorough pre-analysis. So wouldn't it be great if you could make a prediction already before the actual filing and before the drafting stage what the potential of the um, technology that you're patenting is going to be, what the commercial value is going to be, or what risks are you looking at? So in order to do so, we, are, we have combined a TRIS analysis with a SPORE patent search um, that can help assessing the risk and the um, potential of a patent at a very early stage. So that would be helpful to make business decisions very early on and to get potentially also patents issued quicker uh, and more easily, for example, without being asked to do an RCA. And now I want to give over to Tim Clapp. Um, he's going to give you an, um, a basic understanding of what TRIZ, the theory of inventive problem solving, is all about. Okay, thank you, so. uh, Ina. We are sharing a microphone here, so I'll kind of stay close to this, this area here. Um, I have already. Okay. Um, first, good afternoon. We're standing between you and the social hour, uh, so uh, we'll, we'll be, um, uh, try to be brief. If you have any questions as we go through, certainly ask them. Um, as I was listening to uh, Mr. Gilder's uh, presentation this afternoon, you know, what makes this a hot topic, okay? One of the things he talked about was time. Okay, how do we um, how do we utilize time? That's the most constraining resource that we have when we have an abundance of information, abundance of, of, uh, of resources. We all have a fixed amount of time. So uh, part of what we're going we're gonna to share with you today uh, and this background theory called the theory of inventive problem solving and how it relates to intellectual property. Uh, Ina and I are both uh, engineers. We're both professionals. We come from more of the uh, new product development side generating ideas uh, that would turn into intellectual property 
And the theory of inventive problem solving um, is a, a method that um, I've taught since uh, around 1995 at the graduate and undergraduate level, particularly the graduate level. So what is this theory of inventive problem solving? What, what's the background of it? Uh, it was developed by a man named uh, Geinrich Altschuler. Back in the late 40s, he started his research. He was uh, an in inventor uh, and patent clerk. Actually, he's a patent clerk slash inventor. Uh, and he's what we would call an intelligent observer. Uh, Einstein was an, I mean, uh, Thomas Edison was an intelligent observer, okay? And he was really looking through patents to try to find uh, ideas that they could develop and rebuild the economy, et cetera. Uh, but he made several key discoveries, okay? As he was looking at many, many patents, uh, all of a sudden several, several key, key patterns came through. And through those discoveries, he developed what's called the theory of inventive problem solving. And the Russian acronym for theory of inventive problem solving is T-R-I-Z, okay? Uh, TRIZ or TREES. Uh, and that's, that's really neat because then if you go on Google and search T-R-I-Z, you get lots of hits, lots of background on this, this methodology. It's relatively new uh, because it only really surfaced extensively after the fall of the Soviet Union and uh, some of the, the, the specialists came over in the early to mid-90s and uh, br brought this theory over. Uh, the key discoveries, well, there were a number of key discoveries, but see, these are some of the main key discoveries. Uh, one is that problems and solutions were repeated across industries and sciences. Uh, <clears throat> basically, what Al Schiller discovered is that, uh, that industries had the same types of problems. They had specific constraints, whether it's uh, the electronics industry with the medical field or uh, one type of agricultural industry versus a... a, a uh, coal mining, etc. They had similar types of problems and the solutions were also similar. They had specific different applications of, of uh, the application of the, of the solutions. Additionally, that the innovations used scientific effects outside the field where they were developed. Now, <clears throat> as Altshuler was looking at these patents, and let's say he picked up a patent, read the patent and said, this is, this is a novel patent. This is really innovative, okay? This inventor took a scientific effect that let's say was used in the electronics industry and applied this scientific effect to solve a problem that I have in the medical device field, okay? So he coded that as, as innovative, so it's taking scientific effects that within the field of knowledge they didn't use at the time uh, when it was invented, but they went into another field to do that. Uh, another uh, key discovery is that Altshuler identified patterns of how technology evolves, okay? Starting out from infancy as it, as it grows to maturity, how the technology evolves, and he identified eight basic patterns of technology. So, and why is that important? Well, if you know where your technology's at, then you can begin to predict where it's going to evolve next. Now, it doesn't have a time frame on it because those are limited by market forces, need, and uh, the, the resources available. And the third, fourth uh, <coughs> discovery is, as Alt Schuller was looking at these patents, as many of you know, that uh, he wanted to somehow characterize what's called the inventive level of the patent. Okay? This is a really novel, really neat patent. Uh, as opposed to just a, a, a tweak in a process uh, that, that you could still get a patent on, but it had, it had very little innovative value to it, okay? Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about more of that in, in a second. <clears throat> this slide refers primarily to the, if you think of all children in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, looking at, at patents, and, and he evaluated critically over 40,000 patents. Uh, and he would look at the specific problem and then say, okay, this was a neat patent, okay? How do I think of this as, as, as putting these patents into different categories, okay? And one of the things he noticed as far as the common problems and the common solutions, 
he would analyze a patent and, and look at the specific problem and generalize it in the form of what he called contradictions, okay? A technical contradiction, for example, is I want to increase strength, but when I increase strength, the weight goes up. So they call, we call that a technical contradiction. A physical contradiction would be I need something small, but I need it large, okay? A good example, uh, and this is a, a case that I worked on with a medical device company. Uh, they were developing a, an aortal stent, okay? And they needed a structural device to hold the stent in place. So when it was deployed through the vein, it needed to be small, okay? Because this was not an open heart surgery. This was an, an, kind of an implant uh, going through the, the, the vein. So it needed to be small while it was going through the vein, but yet when it was in the artery, the large part of the, of the heart, it needed to be at about an inch in diameter, okay? So the physical contradiction was it needed to be small and it needed to be large, okay? So how was that resolved, okay? And uh, Alt Schuller would code that as a general problem, okay? I've got a physical contradiction. I need something small, I need a large. How was that resolved in the patent literature over and over again? And he came up with what's called general solutions. Okay. So uh, to physical contradictions, uh, they were resolved. Can I separate the contradiction, the physical contradiction, either in time, in space, in scale, or in state? Okay. Now, um, one of the, if I, if I were to, to reduce this to an example, and changing the state, uh, it's used extensively now. As, as we've gone to gi digitization, uh, and everything is kind of uh, digital versus analog. Okay, can I change this physical state, my picture, into into digital? Okay, then I can transfer it around the world instantaneously. I can solve problems of, I, I need to. I'm I'm USA Today, and I need to print. I need to have newspapers at every hotel's door at 6 a.m. in the morning, you know, how do you do that, okay? Uh, so they've got a physical contradiction. How can I be in multiple places at the same time in different time zones? Uh, and so you can't have one printing operation in New York or at, at some point. So if you digitize the paper, if, it, if, you, if you change the state of the, uh, the paper itself from a, a printing press into a digital form, then you can instantaneously trans, transfer it anywhere in the world instantaneously, print it at the desired time, you solve that problem. Okay. So think about this logic of taking a specific problem, generalizing it into uh, what we call a, a general problems, and how are these general problems solved over and over again in the patent literature, these known solutions, and that's a key, they're proven solutions, uh, and the only thing that makes them specific is reducing them to solve your specific problem to your conditions, whether it's in the medical field or the electronics field. So how was, uh, and oftentimes we use scientific effects to carry that out. Now, talking about scientific effects, taking scientific effects from another field and applying them in your field oftentimes generates uh, very, innovative patents, high level, higher level patents than just taking something that you know and making a minor change to it. So uh, the most common innovative solutions utilize scientific effects from other fields. The typical approach by inventors, okay, if I'm an inventor and I've got a scientific effect, okay, I'm going to see where I can apply that scientific effect to other areas, okay, or I've got a problem. Okay, I'm this medical device company, and I'm trying to develop a structural support system for this uh, artificial artery. Now, you might be asking, why is someone from the College of Textiles, I'm from the College of Textiles, NC State University, uh, what are they doing talking about IP or working with um, companies that make medical devices? Well, in the College of Textiles at NC State, we have a, a medical focus. We have inside the body textiles, and outside the body textiles, okay? So uh, the, the first artificial artery was designed and developed at NC State University using a, a, a machine that makes the, the ties, okay? Uh, so believe it or not, textiles is more than just, just clothes. So um, I was actually working with, with the medical device company 
that was, that was, they actually knitted the artificial artery, but they needed structural support. So going back to that physical contradiction, I need it to be small, I need it to be large. Uh, they identified a scientific effect that was outside of their field, okay? It was common in the electronics field, and it was called uh, uh, shape memory metal or nitinol. It's a, it's a metal, it's a combination of, of nickel and, and uh, titanium, a certain combination such that at a certain temperature, it will remember a shape, okay? So you teach it the shape at a given temperature. Let's say body temperature is the shape that you want it, okay, to deploy. At a, at a lower temperature, it goes back to a different shape. So what, what this medical device company actually developed was they took advantage of the scientific effect at low temperature uh, <clears throat> the the diameter of this metal support was the diameter of a pencil okay it could be deployed into the body when it was expanded and and actually uh, deployed from its from its shield into the area of the of the aorta this night and all the shape memory metal would expand the diameter of a quarter it made a rigid support at the top and the bottom, so it, it didn't move, it stayed where it was supposed to stay. Uh, and that was an example of using a scientific effect uh, that, that wasn't commonly known. Now, in the electronics industry, this, this metal is used a lot such that if you have a circuit or a, a, a device that overheats, it will open the circuit, okay? It, it, because at a certain temperature, it remembers, I need to change shape so it would automatically prevent you from overloading the computer, overheating a coffee pot, et cetera. Um, so you get the idea of scientific uh, effects here. And <clears throat> there's an opportunity that we'll talk more about later is it allows you to rapidly organize patents into science and scientific effect areas. Okay? And, and when you start using the innovative language of, uh, it's, it's kind of an abstract, a higher level language of thinking about how to move things, strength, uh, force, waste, uh, general terms that are used to describe, that are often used in claims uh, to describe your processes and, and how they work. You can, you can very quickly cut across industries um, and search other scientific effects that, uh, that change shape, that uh, are affected by uh, change in temperatures, et cetera. Now that third area I want to expand on a little bit more because I, I mean I love this area, okay? Uh, because this can uh, if you're if you're an inventor, okay? What's coming? What do what do I need to focus on next? Or if you're uh, the head of R and D for a uh, for a for a company, and you want to decide what what direction or how you should spend your R and D resources, okay? I want to generate intellectual property. Uh, it could be to develop new products, or it could be for blocking, uh, to block other industries from moving in that direction. There are lots of strategies, what I call business strategies. Okay? This goes back to looking at how technology evolves. Now, I don't have time to go through the, the eight patterns. There are many more patterns. There are more patterns, sub-patterns used today. When we think about a pattern of evolution, there are stages. Now, uh, if you look at the box, for example, the blue box block, blocks have been reduced to practice. The yellow blocks were not reduced to practice. Uh, and the X marks where, where the technology is today. Okay? Now, if I can predict where the technology is going to go, I've got opportunities. These are future opportunities. These may be missed opportunities okay, that, were, that were overlooked. Okay? Uh, a good example of this is one of the, 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 the trends is going from macro to micro okay that's a simple way to put it they've got some different uh, different terms but uh, think about the first block as a solid the next block as uh, a joint multiple joints a flexible system then a fluid system and then to a field okay so I, my technology is going to evolve from something that's fairly rigid and large and as I begin to evolve that technology it's going to get smaller and smaller that's, that's one of the lines of evolution. Now, I love this example. Uh, think about the men's razor, okay? 
the Gillette razor. Uh, first, you had a one-bladed razor. You remember back the, the old days, if you look at some of the old Western movies, and there were then you had two-bladed razor, right? You had two sides. That way you could shave on one side when it got dull. You could turn it over, shave on the other side. And then you jumped all the way to mini blades. So you had the Norelco electronic razor with, with and of course, uh, you could extend the technology on out to, to fluid systems, I guess need, I, I, don't, I don't know about that, but for hair removal. Uh, <clears throat> but when uh, a razor company started looking at their lines of evolution, they said, you know, there was some areas that we skipped. Guess what we had? We had the three blade razor. Guess what the next generation's coming out with? A four-blade razor, okay? There were missed opportunities uh, at, and when you look at the lines of evolution. And I know some companies systematically in their new product development and their R&D go through these lines of evolution systematically to look at, at where, where there have been gaps and where there have been um, misses in the evolution. But, but this helps you begin to understand the, the level of innovation as you, as you look at where your technology is at. And it's, and it's also good for, if I want to build an intellectual property portfolio, okay, I can strategically decide how I want to do that. I might want to invest a certain amount of, of capital resources uh, to, to try to get intellectual property on an advanced field that I may know that, that I'm not going there, but I want to block my competition. Okay. Right. Yeah, question? Yeah, sure. Sorry, but are, are they necessarily missed opportunities or? They're just overlooked. Are they overlooked or is that, you know, if I'm your competitor, I'm going to try to leapfrog you. So if you've got the single blade, I'm going to, be like, well, I'm going to come up with the double blade. And, you know, instead of trying to play that catch up, you know, maybe coming out with the next, well, let's not go with the double blade, let's go with the triple blade. Right. I, you know, I can see that with the processors. Or, you know. Right. Well, this, this is, this is in, the, the interesting fact is, think about knowing the, having this knowledge, now you, you're going, going back to a business decision, a strategic decision. Do I want to invest R&D resources and maybe patent something out here, knowing that the opportunity for me to reduce that to practice today is not economically viable? Okay. But I, I lock up the intellectual property. Uh, as a strategic move, okay? And oftentimes when we look at the, 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 the history of, of how technology evolves, you know, it's, oh, we just, we just skipped that opportunity. It wasn't, it wasn't purposefully leapfrogged. It was just an opportunity that was just, that they went from the two-blade razor to the electric razor, and how long have we had the two-blade razor? For years and years. It was just an overlooked opportunity. Uh, now, you're seeing the new razors coming out now. They have some type of ultrasonic uh, ability to increase. Guess what? There's another line of evolution that, that deals with that. So I can tell you where some of these developments are coming from. Um, a quick, quick story. Uh, one of the companies that develops uh, toothbrushes did one of these uh, uh, line predicted evolution studies in, their, in an R&D group in like 1995 or 96, okay? They videotaped it, okay? Uh, and they came out of there, they had some ne really neat ideas just because it doesn't inhibit your creativity. It just says, look in these directions. This is where the technology is going to go. Now, whether it goes there in five years, one year, or 10 years, or it's ever implemented is a function of, of uh, the, the consumer need, the re re reducing it to practice in terms of the economic viability. Another uh, trend is, uh, the, uh, is the move towards automation. Technology will go towards automation, but it will, it will be limited by the economics of it. Is it economically viable? Okay. Uh, but in that, the, the example that was videotaped for the toothbrushes, they identified an, of, of where the technology was going to go. They didn't do anything with it, okay? They can cite a line of patents today that, that, that the competition has of toothbrushes that they predicted where the technology would go uh, because they're, they're more flexible now. You remember you had the old hard plastic and now you've got flexible handles and they're big handles and they're curved handles and uh, they're electronic, they're, they're circular in motion, you know, this, this is where it's going to go. There, 
electronic disposable toothbrushes now. Okay. Anyway, this kind of, it just gives you a flavor of understanding how technology evolves. And when, when, I, when I teach this at the graduate level at, at, at NC State, jointly with the College of, of Management, uh, you've got the traditional way technology evolves, following lead users, looking at what the government's coming out with. That helps you kind of uh, predict the, where technology is going. But this is another additional method that helps you in that uh, predicting where technology is going. And what I want to spend a little bit more time on is to quantify the innovation level of a patent. That's really where we're going to focus today. And, and Ina has done some wonderful work there in how do you go through and quantify the level of innovation uh, in a patent. And this chart, I know it's difficult for you to, to read, but conceptually, let me, let me kind of share with you what's, what's happening here. Alt Schuler, he gave an innovation level rating from a one to a five in terms of the innovation of a patent, or the level of innovation. One is, it's kind of obvious, there's not much innovation there to a five, which is a, a key discovery. Now, if you, if you take the patents, and, and a number of his as, uh, colleagues, that they've looked at over two million patents collectively uh, in, in the former Soviet Union and around the, the world. They, uh, they said that 32% of the patents is our level ones. About 45% are level two patents, level three patents, about 18% level four, 4% 4 and level five were like scientific discoveries, less than 1%, okay? So it's gonna be really difficult for me. So I'd like to, I'd like to develop a level five patent, okay? That's, that's a new scientific discovery, like the first uh, invention of the, of the laser or the transistor. That's like that, you know, it, it really uh, may take a lifetime to develop. But if you look at the level ones and level twos, most of those fall into what I call manufacturing. You've got a, you've got a process and you tweak the process and you're making changes with, with, within, your, within your team, within your field. But Alt Schuller said there, there are like six characteristics. So as we're trying to, to value the innovation level of a patent, how do we go about what, what are the characteristics? Now we've got those listed from A to B, kind of the, the rows. A is like the number of attempts. It doesn't take a lot of effort to develop a level one patent. With your team and your department, uh, as, as you're trying to improve, whether it's manufacturing or tweak the system, that's a level one. It can be done fairly quickly. A level two, uh, it, takes, it takes more effort, but it's still within the field. A level three, you, 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 uh, again, the, the number of attempts re refers to the time and the effort. Uh, it takes a lot more effort to develop a, a level four in the traditional way it's done, okay? We're gonna to try to accelerate that with some of the things that we're going to show you and you, with using uh, the TRIS methods helps accelerate that process to get a higher level of innovation uh, into a patent. The field of solution, B, is level ones and level two are generated within the field in which you're working. If it's, if it's that medical field, I can solve problems with, with the knowledge that I have. A level three, we tend to start uh, it's similar technology, maybe uh, close to the field. A level four comes from a different field. Okay, we went out in the electronics industry. We got this scientific effect. We brought it in. Um, C is the solution mechanism. Uh, in in Alt Schuler's case, it was obvious. Okay, now that term obvious in, in terms of intellectual property and patenting has a, has a unique. Uh, uh, a unique definition, but from, from Alt Schiller's perspective, uh, when you look at, okay, this is kind of obvious. It, it, it wouldn't take a, uh, a genius to figure this out. Um, and then as you go from one to four, four is like a, a new generation uh, or a, definitely bringing in a, an outside technology in. Uh, C is a solution mechanism, uh, a new generation design for a level four. Obvious for a level uh, C, I mean level level one. Characteristics of the system. If I'm whatever system I have, uh, if it's a level one, level two is within an existing system. A level a level four is we've gone out and got a new technical system. We brought something in that we didn't have in our field to solve the problem. Looking at effects, uh, principles, and leading to a solution. 
this goes back to the scientific effects. If a scientific effect came from outside a field, it was not obvious, it was like, oh man, I would have never thought to use nitinol to solve this, this, this implant, uh, this artificial artery. I would have, you know, that's, that's kind of a level four type. Uh, that's how you would rate that, that particular patent. Uh, F is the existence of contradictions. Going back, that little overview I gave you about technical contradictions and physical contradictions. If you look at a patent and you identify the contradiction and you see how that contradiction was resolved, that's going to be a higher level of innovation. Okay, if you look at a patent and there's really no contradiction there, uh, it was, it's, it's just a, a, a minor tweaking of an existing system, um, then it would be a level one, level two. So that kind of gives you a feel for, for how we value or, or evaluate the, the innovation level. Now what Ina's going to do is go through a case study uh, and the other thing she's going to talk about is the is the, the, the spore technology that's used to accelerate this process. You can imagine, like, how long would it take to do this analysis? Well, having the, uh, a, a computer system to help accelerate this is important, whether it's, whether it's spore or some other system. So, Ian, I'll let you talk about that. Okay. Yes, sure. Can I have a question? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I'm also an engineer, a former engineer. Uh -huh. And I understand from a technical perspective Yeah. What what we'll do is we'll come. We'll, the question is, what's the like the economic value of of an individual patent, and and we'll address that later on because you have to look at the at the portfolio, uh, and uh, typically, uh, and, and we'll address it. It's it's not a uh, exact science by any means, uh, but typically if you've got a higher level of innovation, uh, <clears throat> there's a there's a higher chance that that that, that covers more, uh, more of the intellectual property field, and so may have more more value. But at the same time, I, I respect what you said about a low-level patent. And with, with Dr. Gilder's presentation today, uh, a low-level patent. Well, I don't know. I, I was going to say, many low-level patents help reduce it to practice, help make it affordable. Typically, your lower level patents are, are focused on how can we make it higher quality, cheaper, faster, and increase profitability, okay? And that turns back into the, the, the value there. So that's, they're helpful there. So then you have to kind of look at the portfolio, okay? okay? So before going to the case study, I wanted to introduce the second tool that we used. So you can imagine um, if we analyze a patent using the TRIS methodology, it is very time consuming to look at each individual patent and go through the claims and so on. So um, we used a software, which is basically a patent search engine that makes it easier to look at the patents, that makes it quicker and easier. So there is a synergy of using this patent matrix software and the TRIS methodology. Now the, the characteristics of the SPORE software are that you actually start from looking at the very core uh, field that, in, that is the technology you want to patent and you go outside from the very focus you go to the outskirts. Usually it's done the other way around. You look at the broad field first and then you focus in on um, on what you want to patent. So this way, now going from the inside to the outside, for example, having four characteristic parameters like A, B, C, D, you do what is called in SPORE a teaching search and you get 30 hits on this one, 30 patent hits, and you then can directly communicate those results and look at those and you're sure to not miss any hits um, looking at this specific area. Now then you broaden and you, for example, leave out one of the parameters, like let's say A, and you get a thousand patents as hits that contain the parameters B, C, and D only. 
so on. Then you broaden further and you only have two parameters and so on. So this methodology really ensures that on the one hand you don't look twice, you only get each patent once and you don't double check and on the other hand you're also not missing any core patents. So it's very systematic. Oh, that was too quick. Yeah, here we go. So another feature of the SPORE software that makes it very, very quick and easy to look at patents is um, that you can double click a patent and you get a breakup. It, it is going to be displayed in a breakup where only the independent claims are shown. So you can really very quickly look at the patent and see okay, these are the independent claims, these are the most important and the core claims. So that makes it easy to look at a patent just visually. Then you can further break it down and you can also see the dependent claims. Last but not least, another very neat feature that makes it easy and much quicker to analyze a patent or a patent portfolio is um, that you can have a um, patent matrix, a um, patent map that shows the intellectual spaces and the intellectual uh, and the patent hits. So each time when you hover your mouse um, in the software across one of the patents, immediately the abstract of the patent pops up. So this, this is a tool that makes it really easy to communicate a patent portfolio to specifically a non-technical audience. Now we have used both of these tools, the SPORE patent uh, software and TRIZ to do a case study on two patent portfolios. These are both basically from the same company and from, this is a local company in RTP and we chose this because the two patent portfolios uh, depict a really good contrast against each other and also we had a little bit background information about them. So the first patent portfolio deals with optical fiber illumination systems. Um, there were 19 patents issued in a time frame of six years Two of those related to other technologies, which we didn't pursue further. Um, the company is or called Remote Source Lighting International. And out of this patent portfolio, uh, or out, this company, at pretty much at the end um, of the development of, these, uh, of this port patent portfolio, filed one patent that is related to a different field, to the field of UV purification of liquids. And this one patent was a very high level patent and it was preceding the foundation, a spin-off of the company which then was called Remote Light Incorporated. So this one patent preceded um, or was the first patent in a new portfolio and this portfolio in the area of U UV purification of liquids uh, contains a total of four patents um, that were filed and issued in less than one year. So in order to do the, this analysis, I of course did um, a thorough background check to understand where we are really in the technology field. And in this case, it, uh, this demonstrates that it is really helpful if you do a TRIZ analysis, that you work with a, um, with a number of people, that you work in, with a team of uh, experts with di different expertises. So really that you get the input from, from a lot of different backgrounds. So in both, in both, um, in the portfolio of the illumination engineering, first of all, the overall science can be identified as optics. Now optics can be broken down into several different science fields such as geometric optics, color science, illumination engineering, and many, many more. Science fields, again, can be broken down into more, into smaller subcategories, again. For example, geometric optics, parts of geometric optics is lenses, mirrors, prisms, and so on. Illumination engineering can be broken down into remote lighting, light pipes, optical fibers. Um, so I have highlighted in red and blue those areas that are relevant for the patent portfolio that occur in the patent portfolio illumination engineering. As Tim had shown earlier on, we have six parameters in the TRIZ 
um, innovation matrix that characterize a solution or what we basically in Tre's terms a solution means a patent. Um, I'm, for the case study I went uh, through for each single patent, each individual patent, I went through each of the uh, parameters and rated the patent. I did not do that for the first parameter because this is more of a conceptual parameter. It is very hard to quantify if you are not dealing with a portfolio within your, within your own company. So I left that out. Still, there are five distinct parameters left that can be rated according to the TRIS innovation matrix. And then even if one, one or the other parameter is somewhat su uh, subjective, they are fairly objective and then the overall average is certainly a, a quite objective measure of the innovation rating. So I want to go through just one single pattern to show you how each characteristic comes into play. So the first parameter be the field of the application versus the field of the solution. Now where, how do you characterize where you are in your technology? Well, I looked in the patent and the problem they were describing um, was characterized by certain terms, by certain words, like optical fiber coupler, optical fiber manifold, fiber optics, flex flexible light pipe illumination system. All these terms are located and that, and you have to do research to know that and that's why this technology map is so important. All these terms are located in the science field of illumination engineering which is distinctly different from the science field of geometric optics. Now, the invention, like the patent, the claims that actually solved the problem um, were described by terms like lens, reflector, segment, converging element, which is clearly out of, the, which it belongs to the science field of geometric optics. So we see the discrepancy of field of application and field of the invention field of application versus field of solution. So the solution is in, in a totally different science field and according to the TRIS innovation matrix, that gives you a, a level four innovation or macro invention. Now looking at the second um, para or the third parameter here, solution mechanism, um, the solution using a converging element is not part of the technology of an illumination engineering, but a mechani mechanism from the science field geometric optics. Now what is also important about this mechanism is that it is really a scientific effect. It's not just engineering. It is something that has a scientific meaning that, um, that is something that requires scientific knowledge to be applied so again, according to the matrix, um, to the in innovation matrix, this, this parameter makes, uh, rates this patent as a level four invention. Now we look at the characteristics of the system. The new illumination system um, combines components from the previously traditional system, which is a flexible light pipe, and new components of other sciences and it results in a completely new system. Now the difference between the old system and the new system is very significant in terms of that um, in the old system, the fibers, the individual fibers that carried the light um, as a remote, as a, as a light pipe, um, had to be spaced very closely together in order to carry as much light as possible because every, um, every space between the individual fibers would, um, would take light in but would basically, uh, the light would get lost in those spaces. Now with the new system, this, this effect is completely eliminated um, by, con by using converging elements and mirrors, they achieved to be able to space the fibers further apart from each other and not losing any light in between the spaces, in between the fibers. So it's, a re it's really a new system. So the characteristics are, it's a new system, it's not an improved old system, it's not an improvement on an existing system, but it's a new system. Again, according to the TRIS innovation matrix, it's a TRIS level four. 
the effects principles leading uh, to the solution. It's a combination of several physical effects. Now we are looking at what are the physical effects? Are they tricky? How are they combined? Um, were they well known? Or so on. And in this case here, it's, it's quite tricky to implement this. However, the effects have been known before. They are well known. I mean, lenses have been known in uh, geometric optics for a long time. It's nothing new. So, um, but still not in illumination engineering. So from this perspective, if, um, if you look at the TRIS innovation matrix, this would be a TRIS level three invention. Now the last parameter, we are looking at the existence of contradictions. Well, before the invention, there were a number of contradictions, mainly um, dealing with the loss of light efficiency. The, the, exist, the existing systems before the invention, the main problem was that the longer you would have the pipes or the, the more light you wanted to transport, the more light you would also lose. So, for example, if you <coughs> wanted to transport more light, you, need, you, want, you needed to increase the number of fibers to transport more light. Well, if you increase the number of fibers, you also increase the space between the fibers. And that meant you were losing light because you were losing light in the space between the fibers. So there is a contradiction of number of fibers going up while the light efficiency is going down. Also, if you were to use bigger fibers, still you can pack big fibers as closely as you can pack small fibers. So again, there is a contradiction with light efficiency. Spacing of the fibers, spacing of the fibers itself. You tried, um, it is much, much easier and cheaper um, to just put some fibers together than trying to pack them really close. So it's an it's a, it's a, um, engineering problem to really pack fibers close and it's very, very expensive also. So there again, you want to get the spacing of the fibers up because um, you, want to get the light, you want to get as much light through and reduce the space between the fibers. But then again, um, actually, the, the, if you space, the, what I'm saying here is the space, if you have higher space between the fibers, this would be a cheaper solution, but at the same time you would have more space between the fibers and your light efficiency would go down. Now the solution here completely eliminates these contradictions because the light efficiency is absolutely independent of the number of fibers, the size of the fibers, and the spacing of the fibers because it doesn't uh, there is no light getting lost between the fibers in the spaces between the fibers. All the, all the light is transported through the fibers and th uh, the light can be focused with those converging elements. It can be focused in the core of the fibers. So there is not any light getting lost. So these contradictions previously present in the, prob in the system are completely resolved. They don't even exist. So from that perspective, it's also a TRIS level four invention for this parameter. Now I did this analysis for all the 17 patents of the portfolio of um, light guide illumination systems. And I also did it for the portfolio of UV disinfection. And there was another spin off in the area of medical devices that I rated also. They are color coded and I took, I, to have a better overview, I took out 14 patents in, in the middle that were kind of low level patents. So you see, the principle was that I did, I rated, I did all the rating from, for each of the parameters, B, C, D, E, F, and then did an average score. Oftentimes, the levels of the individual parameters are, are similar, but still, they are distinct parameters and they may vary. So it is important to, have an, to build the average, to calculate an average score. Now this is a very powerful slide. You see, we are comparing the different um, portfolios here. The x-axis um, depicts the timeline of the development of the patent portfolios, actually of the, uh, of the issue of the patents. Those are patent issue dates. The y-axis depicts the innovation level according to the TRIS analysis. 
Now you see the green, all the green patents, those are the patent numbers, um, are part of the patent portfolio light guide illumination system. And you see we have, well, we have two level four patents, we have three level three patents, and we have many level two and level one patents there. Whereas the UV disinfection patent portfolio contains one level four patent and three level three patents. So these are very high level patents. Also look at the time frame. Again, the issued patents for light guide illumination systems took about six years while the UV disinfection patents were issued in less than a year. Now, here I'm summarizing statistically just with numbers the results that I showed previously. What does that mean? Well, what are the results from the analysis? First of all, um, every TRIS high level um, patent that, or every patent that has been classified as a high level with the TRIS methodology had a solution that originated from outside the system of, this, of the um, problem. So in, in this case, for the first patent um, portfolio illumination engineering, it came from geometric optics. And also for the UV purification patent portfolio, it also came from geometric optics. In addition to this, the UV purification portfolio contained also ideas from, um, the, from the field of optical fibers illumination engineering. So it even went further, including those ideas from the illumination engineering portfolio. So in, in summary, the UV purification portfolio, which consisted of only four patents, contained novelties that were previously patented in the portfolio illumination engineering and additional novelties. The comparison of the two portfolios now, the innovative value of both patent portfolios in the illumination engineering and UV purification is the very same even though the number and the type of patents are significantly different. Even more so, the UV purification portfolio covers additional future-oriented ideas that are not fully developed for commercialization, such as different fiber types that had not been included in the illumination engineering patent, but um, different fiber types, so maybe that you can have a different packaging or so, um, were included in the claims of the UV purification patents. Now, what does this mean? In ter what are the conclusions from the case study? Well, the number of patents in a portfolio is misleading and really doesn't represent or is not a measure of the value of the portfolio. And that really is in line with what um, um, the red head, I, I forgot his name, um, guy said this morning about, he was showing a slide um, about Microsoft developing more and more, uh, trying, to, um, trying to increase their number of patents. Well, the number of, uh, the, uh, the amount of dollar revenue was in line or was really correlating with um, the amount of investment in engineering efforts at Microsoft, but it was not correlating with the number of patents. The number of patents issued was a totally different line. So this, this really corresponds to this conclusion here. The number of patents in a portfolio does not represent the value of the portfolio. Also another thing is the, le the less patents you have, well, that is def uh, the less time you have and the less time you need to get those patents filed and issued, the better you are against your competition. The thing is with a strategic um, and really good analysis up front, um, the patents, are, uh, when I looked at the patents, the patents were um, formulated much clearer. 
much cleaner. They were much shorter. And so it is interesting because I looked at the time from filing to issue, and it was very clear that they were, f they were issued within half a year, whereas a lot of the patents of illumination engineering took like one and a half years from filing to issue. So apparently the patent office, you know, took much longer. And what I said at the very beginning, you know, maybe they had, they, they issued a request to reiterate, to rewrite the patent, and they had questions. So, so with a very concrete, very specific, and very clean patent that you design, um, it, you can really, you can really cut down on the co on the time to get the patents issued. I, I would disagree with that. The fact that um, you know they don't. There's a lot of pendency in the pat uh, the PTO, and that pendency um, is determined by what the field of art. Now, if 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 it just so happened that you selected a number four mm -hmm. is in a different field of art, and it's a new field of art. Mm -hmm. That may cut down its tendency time because there's not a backlog in that art. Mm -hmm. But they don't look to, they don't set their priority based on looking, there's no assessment at basing their priority on how structurally and how sound, they don't do a, a precursor of the pattern. Okay. It gets put into a uh, it's first in, mm -hmm. first out system. Okay. Well, that was just something I observed, and it was very clear that each of the patents I mean, so it may, have gone, time, it may yeah. have gone to a new field of art. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I wondered yeah. if some special, if, if, for example, a petition to make special had been done um, in those cases. Because that's a very I short time period for penalty patents these days. Yeah. Well, the other, I, I do think that the other um, influence that makes the issue shorter is just the number of patents. I mean, it's easier to file only four patents in a shorter time than file 17 patents. Just the number of patents uh, that you file, it, it will take longer to file those because it Are takes more time to file or time to issue? Um, well, I mean, uh, um, we're outside your language. Yeah. <laughs> well, the whole. I think that's where we need Janan here. Yeah. Yeah. Janan actually, yeah. you know, filed uh, the, the patent. So. Well, even I understand that there is a difference, <coughs> and I looked actually at the um, at the issue dates. But still, you know, the filing, uh, even if if the issue dates are much later than the filing, but but still, you know, you you start filing patents over a longer pe or you file patents over a longer period of time, which then results also. In a in a longer time period of issue of patents. For example, if you file if you file a patent, if you have 17 patents and one gets filed in 1995, one gets filed in 1996, one gets filed in 1997. So then you already have like a filing period of two years. While a portfolio with only four patents, those four patents were filed they were filed within three months or half a year. And then the likelihood that they all get issued in a short amount of time is also higher. The biggest determiner of that very short period of time, and I would bet, is that they were allowed on a first action. Yes. And that's very rare. Yes. And particularly in crowded art, obviously. Yes. So if you are breaking through and you craft it carefully, yes. the examiner is allowing it on the very first look that's what is, you is very unusual. Yes. Yeah, yes. that's unusual. And that, that really is the biggest uh, issue there. Mm -hmm. Because you just don't have this over and over looking and yes. arguing and waiting and looking. Mm -hmm. you know, the, and the examiners in the system uh, have a, a fixed amount of time to respond. Yes. So just just getting a, getting the allowance first action, is uh, it would have been twice that long had there been another action. Yeah, yeah. That is true. That's exactly what Jinan said. And, and you know, I didn't get it across. So, so again, a thorough analysis at the very front end of, and even before patent filing, um, gives you the opportunity to make business decisions early on to identify the most valuable patents to pick patents and not just 
file many patents to cover your space, but determine where really future resources should be invested, which spe specific claims should be filed, and how the patent specifically needs to be drafted. Is that proprietary software for the searching? Yes, it is. It is. MCAM? No, that is um, SPORE patent matrix. Oh, okay. So that's what I think you could use any, you know, um, okay. I think that would, it's really just to, to speed up the, 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 the um, bring the patents together and being able yeah, to, to, look to, to, to look at the claims, et cetera. So I see, you know, part of your analysis, you're looking, you know, to make your business decisions, you're looking at your competitor's patent portfolio. Now, what type of evaluation to see have you done on the confidence, on the confidence of your decisions, taking into account that the information that you're looking at is three years old because of your competitors, because publication is only optional if you're not going to go for foreign uh, protection. And uh, the average tendency for an application is you know, three years. So you're making a lot of business decisions on your competitors that could be three years old. Yeah. Well, I, I think that um, you're, you're exactly right. The, the, the question is, is uh, you know, making business decisions uh, based on this analysis. <clears throat> you, you don't make business decisions just on the patent portfolio. You, I mean, there are a lot of things that go into this, in this, this analysis. Uh, I think where the, the, the one of the key values here is is uh, looking at uh, you know kind of going back to combining this with looking at, at the, the level of innovation and and then combining that with you know predicting future developments taking this the knowledge of, of where technology is going to go um, helps in that valuation but what you know getting at uh, evaluating where the where the with you can evaluate where the technology is going to go, and that allows you, whether you develop that technology or your competition develops that technology, helps in giving you another piece of information. This is just one other piece of information that, uh, that, that helps in the, uh, in the valuation process. Going back to your, your question about, uh, well, the, the, the value of the portfolio. Um, if the, for example, the the, the four UV related patents cover a broader territory uh, and uh, they would uh, they would tend to have more value than uh, four that covered less intellectual space so to speak uh, but then at the end of the day that the value is is always determined by the marketplace so it's not a it's not a one-dimensional uh, aspect but but I do know, like going out, uh, stock prices are often determined by the number of patents. They look at a company's number of patents. Particularly, if you're looking at, at these startup companies, the, the the growth companies, that's one of the one of the factors that's looked at in valuing the stock. And uh, having some a, a, an analysis like this may may help in providing more data, more information, to get a a, a better picture. Just because I've got 20 patents in a portfolio, if I don't have any really innovative patents that maybe cover a broader space, it may not be worth as much. So just looking at the number of patents uh, is not very much information in making that decision, and hopefully this provides more information. Okay, good, good question. Other questions? So to go back to the central theme is in um, differentiating patent value. You've got a criteria and there's a Continuum, and right. you're able to to mine the, the, the data of the of the say a, a given portfolio, or do you start with the subject and then look at patents and then evaluate the strength of those? Of the yeah, it it all depends on your your business objective. Uh, if if you if you want to look at a, at a field, and from a from a you know a, a management perspective, you're kind of looking at the white space for market opportunities. Uh, this is a way to kind of look at the at the white space for uh, technological developments or, or IP opportunities there um, and what happens is as as you begin to apply the methodology it it, it does kind of change the way you think okay uh, it, it's I, I can tell you from from teaching uh, students at the at the 22 to, to 25 year uh, age range is that the methodologies helps them 
and, and, and looking for better solutions faster because they, they begin to think looking across fields instead of just in their one area of, uh, of, of their technical and academic knowledge. It helps them abstract up and search over. And I think that um, by doing that, it, it helps anyone that's trying to, whether they're the inventor, to, um, to how do I describe what I've invented? Can I do it in, in the broadest terms that can be defendable, okay? And, and I, I think, I, w I wish Janan were, were here to be able to describe more the detail of how it's affected her ability to, uh, to as, uh, as a patent attorney, to work with clients to write patents. Um, and, the yeah. core of this would be then to, to characterize the higher level principle or technical effect. Mm -hmm. Then you go into this ocean of other uses of that technical effect and go borrow it from another field. Is Ex that exactly. where you're going? Exactly. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. If, if, I, if I understand my, what, whether I'm trying to take a, a technology, reduce it to practice, improve it, because going back to what Mr. Gilder said today, uh, oftentimes, and working at NC State University in, in our um, on Centennial Campus where we're trying to encourage uh, taking innovative ideas at a research level and how do we reduce those to practice and generate businesses to generate more jobs in North Carolina. A lot of times we get what we call technological roadblocks, okay? We, we understand the science, we know, but but how do we reduce it to practice such that we can make it and make, uh, make money uh, using these, uh, the TRIS methodology to help go uh, search the, uh, one, search the, 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 the patent field to see what's out there so that if you come up with an idea that uh, you're not infringing, okay, that, that's important, but then to be able to search uh, at a high level and then drill down in other, other fields of technology, other scientific effects that are available that, that you didn't know about simply based on your education, your background, your experience. Uh, and uh, I don't ever want to uh, uh, reduce the, the importance of having subject matter experts and if you've got someone with 20 years experience uh, to take advantage of that knowledge, but we all, when we're, when we're solving problems, we saw problems based on what worked, what didn't work, uh, and, and what we know, and oftentimes, what didn't work 20 years ago would work today because technology's changed, the uh, ability to use computing technology, the cost factor such that, uh, I, have, I have a patent with Levi Strauss that uh, <clears throat> basically the R&D engineer said, you know, we thought about that 15 years ago but we never pursued it because the computing technology would cost more than the sewing machine, okay? When we re-looked at it, uh, the, the, con the controller to control the device that we patented cost $5. A $5 microprocessor four years ago or five years ago uh, could do the same thing that a $3,000 computer 15 years so that ideas that uh, uh, are, are out there are often rejected because they didn't work years ago. Now you come back and systematically take a look at it, uh, and this is another part of the, the TRIS methodologies. Do we have resources today that we didn't have 20 years ago or 15 years or, or even five years ago? And oftentimes those scientific effects, if, if, you're, if, if you're an entrepreneur and you're, you're, you have a scientific effect uh, and it is new, what old problems can it solve today that could that it that wasn't available to solve in the past? Um, and so, so really, yeah. the the point here. Well, we have evaluated the two patent portfolios. In hindsight, done the analysis of how does TRIS fit in in hindsight here. But really, what what really the what we really wanted to show is like how TRIS can help create better patents. Because this is, I'm sure in this, I mean, I know um, Jinan was the one who um, worked on the portfolio UV purification, and she has a TRIS mind. I mean, there, there are definitely TRIS, um, TRIS, there is definitely TRIS thinking that was input for that portfolio. And that shows like, 
well, in hindsight, we can analyze it, but it shows really how the methodology applied can help to make it better and help to make it more effective, quicker, faster, cheaper. There's, there's another analogy to yep. this whole thing. Is that, I was a software engineer for years. It's like object-oriented programming. Exactly. You, you want to make abstractions to remove any dependencies, and then you want to specialize to fix a particular problem. It, it, you know, it, so, it, I mean, you know, I'm a fat attorney with a software engineer, so I know, yeah. I know that's exactly how I approach the application. And I mean, you said that's how claims are written. So, I mean, it kind of dovetails in how I personally I approach mm -hmm. the patent process. And, and, and literally, it's a, it's a way of thinking, okay? Uh, mathematicians do it all the time. You, you can write a, a mathematical equation, the first thing to solve it, they're going to abstract it up. What, what's, the, what's the general solution? What's the, what's, what's the general, uh, let's say, quadratic equation? A plus BX plus CX squared. And, and what's the general solution to that? You've got the general solution, and then you just apply your specific parameters to get the specific solution. So. Uh, the logic is to, how, how can you teach people to, to abstract their thought up to more general terms, okay? You'd like to use more general terms in the claims uh, to get breadth, okay? But as you abstract up, it, the other powerful benefit, it's easier for you to move over to other industries and say, for example, I, I've got a, another patent in uh, an apparel manufacturing where we're moving moving cloth at a high rate of speed, individual pieces, t-shirt pieces, I want to pick these pieces up without losing orientation very rapidly, okay? Um, and so you're looking at uh, moving, grasping the, the, the general terms. So uh, I wanted to, I actually wanted to lift it off the table. I had a moving conveyor, I wanted to lift it off. Okay, how do, how do other industries lift things? Guess what? The aerospace industry lifts the jets with uh, the Kwandua, Kwandua effect or the, the, the airfoil effect, okay? I put a four inch pipe over the, uh, over the conveyor, put a high, jet, high speed jet of air, uh, you get a pressure differential, that uh, thin piece of fabric just follows that, that curved surface it lifts it off every time, okay? Got a patent on that, okay? And that was using a scientific effect in another field to how do I lift small textile objects that are very flexible, very light. I can't just grab it because I want to maintain orientation. Uh, and so it allows you much easier to go up and over. So from a software standpoint, thinking that, that object-oriented uh, allows you to be more generic uh, and then, then you can apply it to a specific problem that you have. Right, but it seems like the difficulty is when you get into that, that number four rating, yes. you, you start to have a problem with enablement. You start writing the application because it, you, you know, you're, you're starting at the high abstract then, but uh, the patent office will only allow you to patent yeah. you know, an apparatus or something that was useful. Right. But if it's too abstract, that's, that's analogous to a mathematical equation. That, that's exactly, and it, go, it goes back to uh, taking that general problem, a general solution, and you come up with a specific solution. How, how do I kind of reduce that to practice? How do I take that, that airfoil effect and be able to uh, demonstrate a reduction to practice to achieve the, the required function of the, of the patent? So, yeah, good question. Often, often when I'm counseling inventors and their idea is bigger than their enabled solution to it, I'll tell them, let's hold that, let's not teach it. That's another invention for another day. Right. And that's sometimes uh, good, good advice to them. Let's just bite off what we can chew. Right. <laughs> well, I'd like to, like to thank you for, for staying this Friday afternoon, and uh, we'd love to talk to you after the fact, but I'm not going to keep you from the social hour. So uh, thank you very much. Thank